Chapter 8 From Distant Lands Luang Po in the Western Sangha If, by renouncing a lesser happiness, one may realize a greater happiness, let the wise renounce the lesser, having regard for the greater. Dhammapada verse 290 There's an author's note here on the use of the term Western Sangha. Strictly speaking, it would be more accurate to use the word non-Thai or foreign Sangha here. A small number of Asian monks, mainly Japanese and Chinese, trained at Wat Pong. However, the vast majority of the foreign monks have been from the West, and the Thai word used to refer to the non-Thais, Farang, is one specifically coined for Caucasians. For this reason and for ease of usage, I have chosen to use the term Western Sangha. Part 1. Introduction Farang From the mid-14th century until its sack by the Burmese in 1767, Ayutthaya was the capital of the Thai nation. Established on an island in the Jabriya River, it was ideally situated to act as an entrepot port at a time when land routes were safer than sea, and merchants in the Orient sought to avoid sending their goods through the Straits of Malacca. Within 200 years, Ayutthaya had become one of the most cosmopolitan cities in Asia. Its population of approximately a million people exceeded that of London. Some 500 temples, many with pagodas covered in gold leaf, lent the city a magical, heaven-like aura that dazzled visitors from other lands. By the mid-17th century, with communities of traders from France, Holland, Portugal and England housed outside the city wall, the inhabitants of Ayutthaya had become accustomed to Westerners or Farangs. The kings of Ayutthaya often employed foreign mercenaries as bodyguards. To the Thais, these strange white beings seem to resemble a species of ogre, hairy, ill-smelling, quarrelsome and coarse, lovers of meat and strong spirits, but possessors of admirable technical skills, particularly in the arts of war. The ogres had a religion. Priests and monks accompanied them, but it did not appeal to the Thais who were content with their own traditions. As Buddhists, they were accustomed to equating spirituality with the renunciation of sensual pleasures. They found the Western clergy worldly and hypocritical, undignified in their rivalries. The Ayutthayan Thais gently rebuffed what they saw as an alien faith with politeness and smiles. However, the legendary Siamese tolerance was stretched to the limit during the reign of King Narai, 1656-88, when a charismatic Greek adventurer, Konstantin Folkon, rose to become the closest advisor to the king, who appointed him Mahat Thai, Minister for Trade and Foreign Affairs, second in power and influence only to the king himself. After his conversion to Catholicism, it is alleged that Folkorn became involved with the French in plots to put a Christian prince on the throne, and thus win the whole country for God and Louis XIV. At King Narai's death in 1688, however, conservative forces prevailed, French hopes were dashed, and Folkorn was executed. For the next 150 years, the Siamese looked on Westerners with fear, aversion and suspicion. But as French and British power and prestige spread throughout the region in the 19th century, the image of the Westerner changed. He came to represent authority and modernity, the new world order that had to be accommodated. As all the rest of the region fell into European hands, Siamese independence became increasingly fragile. King Mongkut, 1851-68, believed that the only way for a small country to survive in the colonial era was by earning the respect of the Western powers through becoming more like them. To that end, he began to reverse policies of previous monarchs and cultivate friendships with Western scholars and missionaries. 
He introduced Western styles of dress and uniform. He predicted eclipses by scientific means, undermining the hitherto unshakable prestige of the astrologers. He also sought to reform popular Buddhism along more rational scientific lines to protect it from the missionary's disdain. After King Mongkut's death, his son King Julalongkorn, 1868-1910, carried on his father's policies and sought to create a modern, centralized state and administration, relying heavily on Western expertise. Members of the royal family and aristocracy were sent to study in the West, particularly to England. The policy was successful. Siam preserved its independence. At the end of the 19th century, however, the French humiliated the Thais by annexing their eastern territories. To many, this confirmed the West's unquestioning superiority in all things worldly. By the time Lung Po reached manhood, the wealthy Thai elite had become enamored with the material symbols of Western culture. Expensive imported clothes, motor vehicles, gadgets and foods were the sought-after status symbols. The absolute monarchy was overthrown in 1932 in favor of a Western-style democracy that was soon displaced by a more potent import, military dictatorship. Fascism was the new vogue, far more appealing to the military men running the country than the messiness of political debate. The country's name was changed to Thailand. Chauvinism was promoted in the guise of patriotism. Cultural mandates accompanied political change. Field Marshal Pibun Songkram passed laws making it compulsory for men to wear hats and kiss their wives on the cheek before leaving for work in the morning. A marginalization of Buddhist goals and ideals, coinciding with official support for Buddhist forms and rituals, became a feature of development that was to become an enduring trait. In the hamlets of Ubon, images of the West came from Hollywood. Travelling movie companies set up their screens and loudspeakers in village monasteries, where Clark Gable and Greta Garbo enchanted their audiences in homely Lao, dubbed live in front of the screen. Thus, the first flesh-and-blood glimpse of Farang in Ubon, exciting though it was, came as a shock. During the Second World War, while the newly ordained Luang Po was studying in local village monasteries, a group of gaunt and ragged POWs was jailed in the centre of town. They were prisoners of the local Japanese garrison, hostages against Allied bombing raids. The local people smuggled them bananas. Then, in the 1960s, came the Vietnam War. Ubon, closer to Hanoi than Bangkok, attained a strategic importance. By the end of the decade, 20,000 young Americans were stationed on a sprawling airbase north of the town. Large uniformed men, black, brown and white, strode along the streets, hand in hand with mini-skirted prostitutes. They caroused in tacky nightclubs with names like Playboy and sought to escape the stress of their lives with Buddha sticks. Overhead, at regular intervals, came the deafening sound of phantom fighters and A-130 airships taking off on missions over Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam. American military personnel were not, however, the only young Westerners in Thailand at the time. It was during this period that villagers working in the fields to the east of Wat Pa Pong became used to a strange new sight. Tall, fair-skinned young men with scruffy hair and dressed in t-shirts and faded blue jeans would often be seen walking along the ox track with a dogged, loping stride and a large grubby backpack like a malignant growth behind them. These young men were the first trickles of the steady stream of Westerners who were finding their way to Luang Po Cha. They were to become the senior members of a Western Sangha, which now, more than 40 years later, numbers almost 200 monks and nuns. More than words. Luang Po, only a few of your Western disciples speak Thai, and you can't speak their language. How do you teach them? 
This was one of the most common questions that Luang Po faced from the early 1970s onwards, as the number of his Western disciples steadily increased. He would explain that he was teaching Buddhism not as a philosophy, but as a way of liberation. Pointing directly to the experience of suffering, its cause and the way leading to its cessation were more important than finding words to describe the process. Sometimes, to clarify this point, he would pour water from the thermos flask on the table before him into a cup. In Thai, we call this Nam Ron, in Lao, it's Nam Hon, and in English, they call it hot water. But these are just names. Dip your finger in it, and no language can really pass on what that actually feels like. In the same way, people of every nationality know the feeling for themselves. On another occasion, a visitor seeing all the foreign monks asked Luang Po whether he spoke English or French or German or Japanese, to which in every case he replied that no, he could not. The questioner looked confused. How did the foreign monks learn anything then? Characteristically, Luang Po replied with a question. Do you keep any animals at home? Have you got any cats and dogs? Any oxen or buffalo? Yes? Well, can you speak cat language? Can you speak dog? Can you speak buffalo? No? Then how do they know what you want them to do? He summarized. It's not difficult. Training the Westerners is like training water buffalo. If you just keep tugging the rope, they soon catch on. To ties, the water buffalo is the epitome of dullness and stupidity. Comparing a human being to a buffalo would normally be considered offensive. Anyone who calls someone kwai to their face is either showing contempt or is spoiling for a fight. Given the exaggerated respect for the intelligence of Westerners common in Thailand, Luang Po's audiences would always find his buffalo comparison both shocking and hilarious. The sight of Western monks made a powerful impression. At a time when Western technology, material advances and expertise were being so touted by the powers that be, here were to be found educated young men who had voluntarily renounced the good things of life that people were being encouraged to aspire to. These were men who had chosen to live austere lives in the forest as monks, not understanding the language, eating coarse food, striving for peace and wisdom in the same way that Thai monks had been doing for hundreds of years. It was baffling, fascinating, and above all else, inspiring. Many visitors would leave Wat Ba Pong thinking that perhaps there was more to Buddhism than they had supposed. If the Westerners had so much faith in it, how could it be outdated? Luang Po's basic technique was not, he insisted, particularly mysterious. He led his Western disciples. He showed them what to do. He was an example. It wasn't necessary to impart a great deal of information. Even though I have a lot of Western disciples living with me, I don't give them so much formal instruction. I lead them in the practice. Good actions yield good results, and bad actions yield bad results. I give them the opportunity to see that. When they practice sincerely, they get good results, and so they develop conviction in what they're doing. They don't just come here to read books, they really do the practice. They abandon whatever is bad in their hearts, and goodness appears in its place. The Westerners had come to Buddhist teachings and monastic life without the cultural conditioning of the Thais. In one sense, they had beginner's mind. Luang Po found their open, questioning attitude refreshing and stimulating. As students, they were largely free of the complacency that he considered such an obstacle for his Thai disciples. On the other hand, their need for explanations could make them susceptible to crippling doubts. Sometimes, questions led only to more and more questions, diminishing the intensity of their practice. 
The Westerners often came to envy the single-minded application of their fellow Thai monks, who seemed blessed with unquestioning faith in the teacher and the tradition. Lung Po said, Once you've got them to stop, these Westerners can see clearly how they've done it. But in the beginning, it's a bit wearing on the teacher. Wherever they are, whoever they're with, they ask questions all the time. Well, if they don't know the answers, then why not? They have to keep asking until they run out of questions, until there's nothing more to ask. Otherwise, they just keep running. They're hot. 